I'm going to do it again. <clears throat> oh, that was a good one. Um, one day, a lady asked Billy Sunday. He, she, she goes to him. I mean, Billy Sunday was a pretty famous preacher in the day, um, way before my time, many of our times. But he went around preach and did revivals. And she goes, why do you keep doing revivals? Why do you keep doing them? And so he decided to ask her a question. He said, why do you keep taking a bath? He said, you get dirty again. So what do you need to get back in the tub? Or why, do you, why don't you just eat one big meal a day and call it good? And that's what he said. He says, we need to continually be reminded that God is with us, that we need to be filled with his Holy Spirit, that we need to grow and walk with Jesus. You know, it's just not a once and done deal. And that's what we have to continually remember as people as well. When we desire to walk with Jesus, we too must come to him and recognize the need to be in daily contact with him, to be regularly with him in every waking moment of every single day. He needs to be a part of our lives. So we're, I'm glad you could join us today. We are up to chapter 12 in Romans. You know, Paul has been weaving a number of threads through all these chapters, and they continually build up upon one another. And today's um, passage begins with, and so, if you're in the Living Bible, it begins with, therefore, in the NIV. And often, I mean, I know we stress this and when we meet in Bible study, anytime the word therefore is there, what do you think? What is it there for? And so you look back on those verses preceding to kind of get you back into zinc, sink and think, oh, what are we talking about? And so that's what Paul does. Because you have to remember in the time period of Paul, when he wrote this letter, there wasn't chapters in it. There wasn't verses written out. Those are for us. The chapter 12 was where there was a paragraph, and it seemed to be a good place to put that number, I guess. So that's how they decided to do that. So when we look at it, I mean, they were looking at an entire letter. So it was all together. Us, we're looking at it a chapter at a time. So in chapter 11, at the end of chapter 11, it said, Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his wisdom and knowledge and riches and how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods. For whom among us can know the mind of the Lord? Who knows enough to be his counselor and guide? And who could ever offer to the Lord enough to induce him to act? For everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by his power and everything is for his glory. To him be glory evermore. What a wonderful God we have, says Paul. After 11, we were learning and learning about being grafted into the family of God, being a part of the family of God, and how when we, when we aren't following him, when we don't know Jesus, like the people of Israel, they were cut off from that tree until they became believers in Jesus Christ. When we become a believer of God, we are grafted into his family. And so Paul said, what a wonderful God we have. Who can know his mind? So please, I would like you to read along with me. It's going to be on the screen because I'm taking it from the Living Bible today. I really liked how that translation put it for us. Um, it is in chapter 12, and the, the version you have in your pews is the NIV. And that is also a good resource as well today. So, as so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy the kind he can accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is that too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be, in a, new, be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. As God's messenger, I give each of you God's warning. Be honest in your estimate, estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete, for we each have different work to do. So we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, then prophesy with whenever you can, as often as your faith is strong enough to receive a message from God. If your, your gift is that of serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, do a good job of teaching. If you're a preacher, see to it that your sermons are strong and helpful. If God has given you money, 
Be generous in helping others with it. If God has given you administrative ability and put you in charge of the work of others, take the responsibility seriously. Those who offer comfort to the sorrowing should do so with Christian cheer. So Paul begins this with, I am pleading with you. I am calling out to you. As a God, you know, he says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. He is calling us to come to, to God and to get right with him. And he is pleading with us. It isn't a, because I'm the apostle, I'm telling you to do this. He says, I am pleading with you. I'm begging you. If you want to really walk with God and know him, this is the best way to do it, by giving yourself totally, completely to him, a living sacrifice, holy, the kind he can accept. And that's only a decision we can make. Nobody can make it for us. We aren't born into it. It is something that we choose to do with ourselves. Sacrifice is always within the means of the giver. When we studied the tabernacle last summer, we talked about how that was created to, to, be a, to be a picture of what Jesus Christ would be doing and how that altar was where they would brought the, the live sacrifices and where the sacrifices were killed and the blood was splattered all over and they had to bring an animal to pay for their sins, to atone for their sins. So that was the sacrifice you know, was, ent was at the entrance to the tabernacle, and they would bring that to the priest, and he would look that over, and he would see that lamb, see that it was perfect, and that it was without blemish, and then he would sacrifice it there. And that lamb, when it was given, it was a once, and, and it was done, because he died. I mean, there was no, he couldn't get back off that altar. It was over. The sacrifice we're asked to bring Jesus is ourselves. We are asked to bring a living sacrifice to that altar. We are asked to voluntarily lay our life on that altar at the front of the temple, in front of, in front of God. You know, we can get back off. We can choose to change our mind. We are a living sacrifice. And when we get back off, we can choose if we're going to really live for God or if we're going to go the other direction. We're not asked to do something impossible, but we're asked to do it. And come to him. Like I said, Paul, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, he says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord of our life, when he is our Savior, our bodies are not our own anymore. We allow the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us. And he take, he, we are his. He has bought us. He paid the price for us when he died on the cross. And when we accept him as our Savior, that's what we're saying. I am giving myself over to you because you died for me. I can't, can't pay you back. And we are not our own anymore. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. So we are no longer our own. That sacrifice, once it is given to the temple, once it was given to God, we are saying, I'm yours, Lord. Everything, there's an old song, old chorus. Everything I am, everything I not, I am yours, Lord. And that's what we're saying when we get on that altar. We surrender to God completely. Like I said, that lamb and that animal, that bull, had no choice. They, once they were there, it was done. They, but once it was given, it was the temples. It wasn't the person that brought it anymore that was given away to God. It was theirs. When we surrender ourselves, when we lay ourselves on the altar, we're saying, I'm yours. I give up my right to myself. Come and live in me and use me. We surrender to God completely, everything about our lives, inside and out. It's also, this is, sacrifice, this is a living sacrifice. Our very life becomes a sacrificial offering to God. Everything about it. The lamb in the Old Testament gave up his life. We're a living sacrifice. Our will is still intact. We have to choose daily, hourly, to walk with God. We have to choose that difference. Our will is still there. The only difference is that sin is dead. When we come to Jesus Christ and when we lay ourselves on there, he takes that all away. He makes us pure and holy in God's sight. There is no more sin when God comes in and he lives inside of us, when Jesus comes in. Our life goes on, and we must lay our life before God at a regular time. A lot of people, you know, 
Peter, in the, in, when Jesus said to him that night that he was betrayed, Jesus, you know, Jesus was telling him what was coming. He says, I'm going to die for you today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be killed, and I'm going to die. And he said, somebody here is going to betray me. And Peter said, no, no way. I would never do that. I am willing to die for you. And he probably was. I'm sure he was. I'm sure it was a sincere thing. And Jesus looked at him. He said, but Peter, three times before the rooster crows in the morning, you are going to deny me. And Peter just couldn't believe that he would do that. But he did. A lot of times we can say we're willing to die for Jesus, but are we really willing to live for him? That's where it's hard. Living is every day, all the time. Are we willing to live for him? It's easy to be a martyr and jump up there. I mean, relatively, it's a once thing and it's over. But living is every day. Can I walk with God? Am I working for him? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? That sacrifice that we bring has got to be holy. Now, we can't make it holy. It's only holy because of Jesus Christ. It's only holy because we're bringing ourselves because we have committed to him and faith to him. We don't bathe our, you know, we don't take, we don't clean our, we don't bathe ourselves before we shower, right? We go in all dirty, and then the shower takes care of it. That's what we're talking about. When we come to Jesus, he's the one that cleans us. When we lay ourselves on the altar, that's when we become holy, when we are dedicated to the Lord. God doesn't want a better you. He wants you just as you are. He wants you right where you are today. He wants you just as you are. He's the one that wants to make you better, and he'll change you. All he wants is us to want him and to accept him and to live for him. He wants us to be acceptable. Our sacrifice has to be acceptable to God. Now, God is not a hard master. He looks on us with compassion. He looks at us when we can't get there by ourselves. He wants to take care of us, and he wants to help us out. You know, we have a, we had an older dog, and the, at times when she wanted to get up the steps. We'd have to help her get up the steps. You know how that goes sometimes. You get an animal that's just getting tired, and you don't want to you don't want to put him down yet, but you want to, so you help him along for a while. Well, God looks on us like that. Sometimes we look like that crippled animal. We look like that, that, that animal that's on its last legs, and he says, you know, I love you. I want to help you. I want to have, I'm going to have compassion on you and help you get to where you need to go. I'll give you the strength. I'll give you the power to do what I want you to do. God helps us. We just have to allow him to. And God will let us know that we're acceptable. When we come to him and we are sincere and we're laying ourselves on that altar, he will accept us. The Living Bible says the kind of, he says that, he says, I have accept your sacrifice and I am pleased. Because Paul says the spirit bears witness with himself, with our spirit, that we are children of God. When we come to Christ, when we ask him into our lives, we are part of his family. We are our child of God. And then we are acceptable in God's sight. It's also a reasonable service. It's reasonable to bring a sacrifice to God, right? I mean, he's holy, he's perfect, he's given us everything. He's asking us to give us something back. And he asks us for ourselves. The phrase at the end of the Living Bible says, the kind of sacrifice he can accept. When you think of, and then it says, when you think of what all that he has done for you, is that too much to ask? God has done, he's given the ultimate for us. He's given us his son to die for us. Is it too much to ask that we give him ourselves back? He gives us everything we need, and he asks us to worship him and to come to him. Worship is spiritual. Worship is what we bring to him every single day. The word translated spiritual and rational and reasonable intelligence is logikos, or log, I can't pronounce Greek, which is where we get our word logic or logical. So being cut off from, remember we are cut off from that family tree if we don't know God. So when we are grafted in, you know, to me it's a not, a, not, a, not doesn't really take a lot of thinking about all this, you know, God has given me everything. He wants to live in me. He wants to, wants to show me the direction he wants me to go. He has a plan for my life. He loves me. He died for me. Um, 
he will give me all I need to do all those things. So it seems to be a no-brainer to follow him and trust him. I mean, what am I giving up? I'm giving up sin and guilt and eternal death. I'm giving up just all those awful things. And I'm gaining life forever with him. I'm gaining peace, and I'm gaining forgiveness for all the mess I've made in my life in the past. And I'm giving, and I'm getting forgiveness, you know, for anything in the future as I come to Him. That's, you know, it's kind of a really, it's a win-win for us. It was, it, but it cost Him everything. And then we look at verse two. It says, "Don't." In the NIV, it says, "Don't be conformed to this world." It says, "Don't let God make you into a different mold." And I was going to bring a cookie cutter. Sadly, I forgot. Um, but you know what it is to be conformed to a mold, right? You have to, I mean, this thing is in a mold right now. It's in, in this shape. And if I put it, try to put this in here, this isn't going to work. But God wants us to not be conformed to the patterns of this world, to not let the world shape us into its mold, it says in another place. And the world wants to change us and make us something acceptable to it, which isn't so great. I mean, there are a lot of things in this world that want to change us, want to change our beliefs, want to change who we are wants to change, wants to say what marriage is, wants to say what um, relationships are supposed to be, wants to, you know, say things that are right that, have all, that are wrong according to God's laws. And it wants to change us to think it's okay. Maybe to think things are okay, a lot of things, things that are okay that aren't. And if we conform ourselves to that, it's really hard for us to live for God if we allow the world to mold us into what it wants us to be. God says, don't be conformed. Don't be molded into what the world wants to mold you into. We can't allow the world's view to shape our view. Whose mold are you being shaped into? You know, when people look at us as believers, they should see something different. If we look like everybody else, if the church looks like every other institution, if the church looks like every other um, clubhouse or club or organization, if there is no difference, well, why would anybody want to be a part of it? I mean, what, what's the deal? We should be different. We should be different because we love one another. That's when the people were first called Christian. It's because of how they loved each other and the people around them. The church has been changing the world forever. I mean, if you look back in history, that's where all the hospitals were began, were through Christians. Um, Harvard and I think Yale, Yale too, all began because of they were Christian universities at one time to raise up pastors for the ministry. Um, all the orphanages in England, Europe <clears throat> and in America were started because of believers. Um, during the time of the Romans, Children that weren't unwanted were left in the gutter. And the Christians were the ones that were picking them up. And they began to take care of them and adopting these children into their homes. And our world isn't all that much di different than, the, than that now at times. There are things that we can be doing as a church that we are not conformed to how this world looks and acts. We need to be different. We need to be in Christ's mold and how he was willing to give himself for others. We need to be transformed. I love that word, transformed. It's the original word for transformed means metamorphosis. What do you think of when you think of metamorphosis? We got, can't be too much, too many science. Butterflies. A butterfly starts out as what? That's terrible. What? Caterpillar, yeah. I mean, that's not too difficult. Most of us can remember that. I was, we were at um, San Diego Zoo the other day, and, uh, and they were talking about how wonderful milkweeds were, and you should be buying them and planting them. And I thought, wow, we can help you out with that. We have them all over the place. And they get in my garden, and I don't keep them there. I pull them out. Um, and they're, they're a weed in my garden. But, there's, but they monarch butterflies need milkweed. I mean, that's what they eat. And that's a cool thing, but caterpillars, I mean, that's what the caterpillars eat. And so the caterpillars, I mean, they, they're these ugly green things or yellow or brown or whatever color they are. And they're kind of cool, actually. They'll crawl up your arms and legs and all that. And then they make cocoons. And then eventually that cocoon 
will bring forth, out of that chrysalis or that cocoon, will come a butterfly. That's what metamorphosis is. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, when he lives in us, there should be a change. We are new creatures. We're totally different. That, <clears throat> that butterfly looks nothing like that caterpillar. That butterfly doesn't eat anything like that caterpillar. They are basically two different species, but they changed, and that's what we are called to be. We are called to be changed, to be transformed. We are not to remain in the same place. We are to becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And we're not to conform ourselves with other believers. We're not to compare ourselves with other believers. I like that song, You Say, because that's, Lauren Daigle made that pretty famous not too long ago. And she says, in the song, she says, you say I am loved, you say I am strong. You know, we think we're somebody else. We'll look at everybody else and say, wow, that person's got it. I haven't. I'm terrible. I can't do this. God doesn't really, really want me to do this because I'm terrible. We, we get into the comparison game. We even do that as churches sometimes. We'll think, well, that church down the road's got a lot more people or they've got a better this or that. And we'll think about comparing or we'll say, oh, there was way more people there. Or, and you'll look at the numbers and you'll start comparing. I mean, there are Sunday afternoons I go home pretty depressed. And that's when I started comparing. And I thought, ah, oh, that's foolish. This is God's church. It has nothing to do with me. And um, he, it's his. And I have to keep reminding myself of that, that the main thing is Jesus Christ. And we have to always remember that, that God created each of us unique <clears throat> and to be who he's created us to be. None of us are created the same. As, and he says, as God's messenger, I give you God's warning, Paul said. As God's messenger, I'm giving you a warning. He wants us all to follow Jesus, but to remember we are all called to different things. We are all part of something bigger than ourselves. We are a body of believers. He says, verses 4 and 5 says, Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete, for we each have different work to do. So we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. We are not to be lone rangers in our faith, ever. That was never, ever God's plan. He called us to be in community, to work together, to serve together. He called us to continue to come together in worship. He called us to be a part of something greater so that as a church and as a church body, we can do greater things together as well. There's an old, <clears throat> there was a mem that was pretty popular, especially during the pandemic when we couldn't get together. And it says, I believe churches are meant for praising God. But, then he goes to but. But, so are 2 a.m. car rides, showers, coffee shops, the gym, conversations with friends, strangers, etc. Don't let a building confine your faith because we will never change the world by just going to church. We need to be the church. And I agree with that, actually. I have no problems with that statement, other than, some, than I've heard it been used as an excuse as well. Because at the beginning it says, I believe churches are meant for praising God. And, and at the end, I like that one too, we need to be the church. Those are very true. We do need to be the church, Monday through Sunday, not just on Sunday morning. But the problem is with sometimes people take that and say, you know, I can have church whenever. I don't need to go to church to worship God. I can worship him out in the, out in the, out in the woods. I can worship him. I mean, I can do whatever I want. Because, I mean, I can do it whenever I want all by myself. I, I don't need to be with others. I don't need to. I mean, I can do it all on my own. I don't need to be, with, be in church to worship God. And that's not what Jesus said. And that's not really what that mem is saying. It's just saying we are to worship all the time, not just in church, but all the time. And they kind of ignore that first part. And that's contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are created to be in a community of believers. <clears throat> I mean, Paul went around planting churches. If that wasn't what he was supposed to be doing, he sure had it wrong. Because that's what he did for all the years that he was preaching. He went around and planted churches all over Asia and all over around Israel. And then he wrote, in, or the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and let us not 
neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are to get together regularly. The early church met daily for prayer and fasting. They got together and worshiped together every single day and prayed for each other. And we all, you know, we get together once a week, many of us. And that's what God calls us to do. But he wants us to go from here as the church. But we're here to encourage each other, to build each other up, to equip us to do the work that God has called us to do. As followers of Christ, fully devoted believers, we are called to be a part of a body of believers. I like how in Corinthians it talks about that body even further in 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> How the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Or the eyes can't say to the face, I don't need you. And that's the way the body of Christ is to be. We're all to be working together and serve together. God, <clears throat> we need each other. And we need when we each have a job to do. It's not just for the other guy. Every single one of us has a job to do. We are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus for the work that he has prepared for us long ago, Ephesians 2.10. We are each created to be a part of God's plan for his mission here on the, in the world. We each have a place. We each have jobs to do. And they come in the form of spiritual gifts that he has given us. Every believer has a gift or gifts from God. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well, Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, he wrote, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. We are each given a gift to help others. Now, our spiritual gift isn't necessarily your God-given talent. Some of us are born different ways and have different talents. I think on a Jarek, I wish he was here today. I want, then I could brag on him, but I can brag on him, and I will just make to let him embarrass him later. But he got 13th out of over 100 kids in math, in a math league. Math, he goes, well, math comes easy to me. And I thought, well, that's cool. That's, that's a talent. He was born with that. I thought, that's pretty cool. And Gary, you all know Gary. He can talk to anybody. And he can talk a long time to anybody. He is friendly. There isn't any stranger that my husband has ever met. That's pretty cool. That's a talent that he was given. I don't have that talent. I have to work at it. But he just, he can do that anywhere. San Diego, I mean, everywhere. It just doesn't matter. But talents are what you're born with. Spiritual gifts are what you're born again with. The Spirit has given each of us a special way to serve in his family and of serving others. And the gifts are named in a number of places in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12 is one chapter. This chapter, Romans 12, um, 1 Peter chapter 4. It's the Holy Spirit who decides which gift you get. He's the one that gives them. And he'll give us more than that. And sometimes they'll morph into something else and they'll change as well as we get older. When we receive the Holy Spirit in faith, he gives us the gift or gifts that we are going to be called to use to serve him. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. We are all called to work together with the gifts that God has given us. Now, we don't all get the same gift. The scripture says that, we, as we read earlier, spoke of believers getting different gifts or special gifts. There's like 20 of them that I, can, that I could find that were real explicit. And so we don't, you know, not every, there's plenty to go around and share. And the gifts that are most clearly mentioned in the Bible are found, like I said, in different places. They include wisdom and knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, the gift of tongues, interpretation, apostleship, teaching, helps, administration, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, evangelism, pastoring, hospitality. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of gifts, but it's got a lot of them on there, doesn't it? There's a lot of gifts that God gives us. And from today's passage, the gifts that were listed, there was like seven of them. Um, and I'm going to, and I'm going to kind of give you an illustration about how we can build up the church. So we have our gifts for a reason. God gives you a gift for a reason to use 
to build up the church, to build up the body of believers, not just the church at South Troy, but the church of God wherever. So maybe your gift isn't even one that'll be in church. Maybe it'll be one that you're using in another area. But that's what God has given each of us, those kind of gifts. According to the Bible, we've, they're not for ourselves, as I said. They're not to make you look good. They're not necessarily going to make you rich. Um, they're not, but, or so that you can make a statement and have people think how wonderful you are. Those gifts are to bless the church and to build them up. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well, Peter said, to serve one another. So how do we use them? So I want to look at a simple illustration. It's a dinner party. You're all together at dinner, and there's, all, there's going to be seven gift, six gifts present at this dinner today. And so we're going to look at them in a, just a real practical way. So as we're all sitting down to eat, you know, there's, here comes, the, we've had our meal, we're sitting back, and we're waiting for dessert. So the hostess, she's bringing out the dessert on this big tray, and she's bringing out all the food, and all of a sudden trips and drops the whole works. And we know what happens. It's a big mess. The dishes are breaking. It's just a crazy, it's just terrible. And so they're all sitting there. And as a response of each person is going to show us what kind of gifts they have. Just real practical. The guy with the gift of, um, the gift of serving, that person's going to get up right away and start cleaning up. They're going to start picking up the pieces. They're not going to wait to be asked. They're going to come alongside the hostess and, and start cleaning up the mess. Then the person that maybe has a gift of teaching is going to say, well, you know, if you, would have not, if you would have had them more balanced or not had so many on the tray, you probably wouldn't have fell down. You probably wouldn't have dropped it. Not that that teaching would be a lot of help to that hostess right now, but it would be somebody that could tell you what happened and why it happened. And then the, the gift of prophecy, that person would have said, would have already had told the hostess when she'd went out, be careful you don't pile your tray too high because when you do, it'll all fall off. And he would, and you know, a lot of times we think of prophecy as fortune telling. Really, prophecy is kind of sharing what will happen with the consequences of what you do. And so if that person is, you know, you can, that person is carrying this thing and they can say, you know, if you carry it that way, you know, that's what's going to happen. And so they've already got their part done. The person with the gift of encouragement is going to come along and say, oh, it's okay. It's going to be okay. You'll survive. You'll be able to serve dinner another day. It'll be okay. Well, I'll love you anyway, and it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. And then you have the person that has the gift of um, giving, and that person already picked up their purse and ran over to Hy-Vee to go get a cake to replace the dessert that was smashed on the floor without being asked. They've already got it taken care of, and they're going to serve, and they're going to help. And then that person with the gift of kindness says, or the gift of leadership first goes, Fred, go get a mop, Mary, go help. Get, I mean, they organize everything. They get everybody working together, and so that's all cleaned up in no time at all. And then the person with the gift of compassion or kindness, they just come put their arm around her because she feels so terrible. She dropped all that dessert and tells them, you know, it's okay. We love you. We'll get it all cleaned up, and we'll have dessert later. No worries. And, you know, the hostess obviously has a gift of hospitality. She's had all those people over for dinner and did, you know, had everything going. So that's how those gifts look in just a dinner party. Now, in the church, they're going to look a little, a lot of them look the same. Serving are people that serve. I mean, that's not too hard to figure out. Encouragement are those people that send those notes or give that phone call or come alongside and say, hey, how are you doing? I've been praying for you. Or the person with the gift of prophecy is the one that's sharing some truth to somebody here at the, that they know and want to share what God is saying to them. There are so many good gifts. And, and a teacher, I mean, that's somebody that has the gift of teaching and is, and is using that to teach others. Paul wrote, don't use your gift. No, he wants us to continue to serve. Now, that, now there are a couple of warnings that Paul gives as well. He says, don't use your gift blend to lord it over somebody else. And, it, and, as from, and he says, don't use your gift blend to excuse you from doing good things. Sometimes we say, well, that's not my job. I can't do that. God didn't make me that way. Romans 12, 13, you know, you might say you don't have the gift of hospitality. But God doesn't give us that option, really. In Romans 12, 13, he says, take care of God's needy people and welcome strangers into your home. That isn't just hospitality. That's something we're all commanded to do. 
we're all to be uh, use those use our homes and our and what we resources to help others. Others might say, I don't have the gift of giving, so I don't have to give. No, that's not what it says. Because the gift of giving is over and above what God has called us to give. In fact, in the Bible, a number of times it mentions a tithe as a good a baseline for giving. And it says, you know, you're so, God giving you everything. Give back to him. 10% is a number that's often put out there. But you're supposed to give back. God gives us everything. He's just asking us to give him some back. So he, we can take care of the needs of the people. But if you're a giver, you're that person that's out way go way and above and giving what God way and above what God has given you. And it might not always be money. It might be time. It might be resources. It might be stuff you have at home. But that's what gift that kind of gift is. I don't even think about it. Um, my husband has a gift of giving. Anytime somebody is, has a problem, the first thing he'll ask me is, "How can we help?" And I have to. Sometimes I feel like i got to rein him in, but I've learned over the years that I don't need to rein him in. God made him that way, and, and that's an awesome thing. I grew up at, that you didn't do that. <laughs> so you, you, made, you had that much money, you budgeted it, and you didn't give it to anybody else. That's how I was raised. We were a giving bunch, so being married to him has been a huge new thing to learn. But that's been awesome because I've been learning how to give. I can learn that too. And sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zones outside of our gifts. Especially in a little church, I'll have to say it's probably, well, I think it happens in all organizations. There's never enough volunteers. And there's always things that need to be done. And sometimes there's just not that person with that giftedness that has either said yes or that they've come to that place yet. And so sometimes you got to step in and take care of that. I know that has happened in our um, teaching ministry with the children on Sunday mornings. Not all of our people feel like they're, that's, that there's a, that's their gift. But they were willing to learn and to be down there with the children and, and share with them. Now that's stepping outside your comfort zone and to doing what God has asked you to do. You know, sometimes you're st- you have to step into a leadership position when you just don't feel called to do that, but you need to do it for a certain amount of time. My sister was sharing that a little bit yesterday. She's in a position that she's really feeling um, overwhelmed with, and she said, I don't think I should be here. And I'm thinking, probably not. But she says nobody else can be there. And so she needs to be there for this time period, waiting for the right person to come and take over that position for her. And I thought, you know, that's the same as, you know, if you were going down the street and there's a house on fire, what are you going to do? Oh, I didn't, somebody said something. Yeah, help them, um, call 911. Yeah, first thing we should be doing. And we should go in and, you know, if there's, if there's something that we can do, we need to do it, right? You don't wait until the professional shows up. You don't wait. You have to, I mean, in the state of Minnesota, we can get in trouble for not doing anything. Um, We have to, if at an accident, if there's people laying around there, you need to do something and help as much as you can until the professionals arrive. That's what God asks us all to do. When we see a need and God has put you there, he's saying, why don't you do something about it? Take care of that need. Step into that place. I'll give you what you need until that right next person comes along. And the other danger is expecting others to do what we know we're supposed to do or expecting everybody to be like us. You know, I have the gift of giving, so I expect everybody to give like I give. Or I have the gift of serving, so everybody should pitch in without being asked. Not everybody's created that way. We're all given different gifts, and he's asked us to use them. And we're not responsible for how other people use their gifts. We're not to judge others over their gifts. So how do you know what your gift mix is? Well, we've talked about it a couple of times. There's plenty of spiritual gift inventories out there. Um, Lifeway Research has a bunch online. We have one on our South Troy group page. Just take that. Um, the, the one on our South Troy group page is pretty easy. Um, and call me, and we'll, may, we'll get together, have some lunch or coffee, and we can go over it together and t- try to see you know, if there's a way that you want to use your gifts to serve here at the church or in some other way in the community. There's nothing magical about them. They're just to help you to see those, that giftedness that, may, that God has put in your heart. I like how Paul tells the Romans, if God has given you a gift, like preaching or prophesying or teaching, he says, do it. Do it with all you got. Give it your best shot. If you're the pastor, work at it with all you got. If you have the gift of serving, like in music or computers or teaching preschoolers, do it with all you have. Give it your best. 
When we do that, we are, we are doing what God has called us to do, and we are serving the cause of Christ, and we are being the bride of Christ. We are being the body. What has God gifted you to do? What gift has God given you? What gift has God given you? Are you using it to help build the church, to serve God's people here at South Troy, to be Jesus' hands and feet in our community? Are you using those gifts? It's time to become part of the body. There's more than enough room for you to serve. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gifts you have given us. Lord, you have called each of us to different gifts and to different times and in different places. And Lord, you know each one of us and you know the gift that we have in you. And, and Lord, sometimes it, it is hard for us to figure out what our gift is. We, we go around in life trying to figure out what you want us to do. Lord, I pray that for that one that is still wondering, that you will just reveal yourself in a special way, that you will really make it known to them, that they will, that they will really feel your presence and, and have someone come alongside them and just verify that that is the gift that you have called them to do. Lord, I thank you for people like that in my life about 20 years ago, and I thank you that they encouraged me and pushed me to try something totally outside of my comfort zone. And Lord, I pray for each one here, Lord, that you will continue to equip and strengthen and guide and direct each one to do the work that you've called them to do. And, th and that it will build not just South Troy, but it will build your kingdom all over this community. And, you're, and we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.